We're starting, you ready? Well, good afternoon and welcome uh, to the latest Out Leadership Leadership Lounge. I'm Todd Sears, I'm the founder and CEO of Out Leadership. And I'm excited to welcome you to the latest in one of the series that we've launched in the last six weeks here at Out Leadership. Hopefully you got to catch several of the other leadership conversations in the last week. My colleague Fabrice Hudor had a great conversation uh, around HIV criminalization um, last week. And yesterday we had a conversation with Michael Adams, the CEO of Sage, talking about LGBT and aging in the age of COVID. Uh, we've got a number of vodcasts coming up this next week that I'll share with you at the end of this broadcast. Um, but I wanna first start, as I always like to start these, by thanking a number of folks, specifically all of the 82 member firms about leadership. Uh, without their support and their continued support, we would not be able to be bringing this, as well as all the other resources that Out Leadership brings globally to the table. I wanna highlight a few firms in particular, EY, obviously, given their leadership and the support today, and we'll get to get into some of the great work that EY has done without leadership. American Express, GLG, Goldman Sachs, KPMG, PwC, Publicis, PIMCO, and Skadden Arps, to name just a few. And I especially wanna thank our global sponsors with whom we couldn't do any of the work that we're doing, not just here in the United States, but all around the world. HSBC, Ropes and Gray, EY, RBC Capital Markets and KPMG, as well as Greenberg Traurig for our support of our talent platforms. So I wanna kind of frame out today's conversation. Uh, hopefully you all saw the information that we sent out and obviously the topic today is purpose. And we really felt like this was an important time uh, to revisit the idea of purpose, not for the first time. Uh, over the last 10 years, Out Leadership has convened a number of conversations, both globally as well as regionally, around how companies and leaders lead with purpose and also with vision. Um, and the idea that a purpose-driven organization, in my opinion, is the most impactful organization. It's why when I founded Out Leadership, we made Out Leadership a B Corporation, which is a purpose-driven social impact organization. We're not structured as a nonprofit by design. I firmly believe that a purpose-driven business can and should be a successful operation and organization, and that you can make change in the world simply through the power of business. And that's been the framework that we've built our leadership on over these last 10 years, the idea that business could drive equality as a business imperative, not as a nice to do, not as a warm fuzzy. And I'm very proud of the work that we've been able to do and the impact we've been able to have through that idea of purpose. This last fall, EY, through a pro bono initiative they call Ripples, decided that they were going to help out leadership take our next 10 years into a more strategic framework. And so we had the pleasure and the honor of working with a number of leaders this last fall for three months. Um, and Patrick Higgins was one of those leaders who was a tremendous asset, who literally sat in the out leadership office with us for three months, lucky him, and worked with us to actually build out a new strategic platform that goes through Oh, here we go. That goes through, this is the benefit of having a fire with uh, a fireside chat. So the strategic platform <laughs> went through what, uh, <laughs> what we could do without leadership going forward. One of the things we're gonna talk about later is exactly how things like that make life more empathetic, right? Because the idea that everything is perfect on a webcast is no longer a thing. And CEOs have kids running through the frame and apparently I have the fire alarm going off. So. That's a, that's, a, that's a bonus for the current time. But the work that the EY team did was amazing around the four pillars that we actually have coalesced, not just our work around, um, but also around what we're doing going forward. And we completed it literally six weeks before the COVID crisis began. Uh, and it's been amazing because it's actually allowed us to complete what we're, what we're ultimately trying to do with an out leadership framework. Um, so I want to I want to thank Jeff and Beth for joining us, and I'll give you a quick intro about both of them. Jeff actually was part of the EY team that worked with us, and his full day job is working with companies around purpose and vision. And if any of you in the audience have seen Simon Sinek um, and the virtuous circles and the ideas that he started at a TED Talk many years ago, that's one of the most inspirational things that I've actually learned from my own mentor Nina Link around how companies can find purpose and how you define that in the marketplace. And so we were in a meeting with the EY team and I actually brought up Simon Sinek and the team said, oh, well, we work with him exclusively. And this guy, Jeff Steer, actually works with him in partnership in this division that EY has that talks about purpose and vision using Simon Sinek and other leaders to help with that framework. And so we had the honor and ple pleasure of working with Jeff on that. 
and I'll let Jeff uh, kind of kick us off here in a second. The other amazing leader we have is my friend, colleague, and Out Leadership board member, Beth Brook. I had the pleasure of meeting Beth many years ago, um, and her story, which I'm sure hopefully everyone on the call is familiar with, is, is tremendous in how she came out and how she used the, uh, the Trevor Project and the It Gets Better campaign as a way to actually formally come out. And she brilliantly talks in a lot of different forums, and we've had the pleasure of speaking together all around the world in the last 10 years or eight years. Uh, around living life in color as an out leader versus being in black and white when she was in the closet. And she's taken that authenticity through her world um, in a tremendous, amazing way. And as the recently retired vice chair of EY, and she was literally leading global affairs and a number of organizational integrations with governments around the world, Beth had the opportunity not just to see how these integrated leaders work and how purpose can drive organizations and governments, but she got to do it as an out gay woman which to me is a tremendous opportunity and has made her one of my favorite leaders we've ever worked with. So I'm, I'm thrilled that they are both with us today. Um, and I'm gonna ask Jeff to kind of kick us off with Beth um, and, and share a little bit about the, the framework around purpose, Jeff. Um, I want us to talk today about how people are keeping purpose, finding purpose, rethinking purpose, um, and how purpose-driven organizations and the leaders that lead them are really gonna be ahead. So with that, Jeff, please uh, kick us off. Yeah, thank you, Todd, and hello, everybody. Um, you know, the, the COVID crisis has really brought focus onto the human part of organizations. Right, right out of the gate, you heard most CEOs say, our main objective is to make sure to ensure that our employees are safe, uh, that our employees are healthy, that our employees' loved ones are healthy. Um, purpose is about putting humans at the center. So whether you are a purpose organization or uh, a purposeful leader, everyone consistently came out and said that uh, during the beginning of the COVID crisis. And we think this is gonna be a turning point, of course, um, for a couple of years right now, purpose has been very popular uh, to declare what you stand for. I think primarily many organizations did so because they realized that millennials and Gen Zs were making up an increasing part of their workforce and an increasing part of their um, uh, the social chatter. Uh, and millennials and Gen Zs really were drawn to this idea of a greater good. I, I want to say one thing about purpose. It's not just about social impact. It's about human impact. So when, when we talk about a purpose-led organization, um, we're talking about um, having impact on your employees, uh, on your customers, on the communities in which you operate, um, on the environment, sure, because the environment is, uh, is uh, intimately tied to the way humans live. Uh, so it, and of course, your shareholders too. Your shareholders in an organization or stakeholders are also human. So um, stakeholder capitalism, if you will, purpose is at the center of that. Purpose is at the center of a long-term value conversation about sustainable impact, positive impact to humans. So um, uh, we're finding that uh, many organizations that are doubling down on their purpose if they were purposeful right now, uh, are going to report better results, uh, the better uh, employees feeling that they care, that the employee cares about them, which we think will translate to um, greater loyalty, greater productivity, greater innovation on the back end. Uh, we're not sure yet, of course, but we, we anticipate that. And then another one other important part, and I'll pause here, about purpose is uh, its sister vision. Uh, if purpose is the way you come to work on a daily basis at EY, our purpose is to build a better working world, building a better working world. Uh, vision is what world are you going to build? And one of the things we're seeing here, um, and pardon the pun, but um, being brought into greater focus is the importance of vision. Many, many organizations uh, and their people and customers are wondering what's going to happen on the back end of this. Where are we going? What's going to be? Uh, there's a lot of uh, disconnection, isolation, uh, and, a, and a lot of stress, not knowing whether you're going to have a job, whether you're going to be able to financially afford things, whether you're going to be included as you were before. So uh, this combination of leaders having a vision for the future uh, and also operating uh, uh, on a daily basis with purpose is very important today uh, as it will be tomorrow. Beth, give I me think your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, I, I, well, I think it, I couldn't agree more with, with Jeff on this and the, the concept of the, the stakeholder focus now. 
Um, and what I found interesting, well, there's a recent Harris poll that said nine out of 10 Americans expect a company right now to be engaging in community support. And they followed that on and, and actually think they've ticked it week by week. And are finding that Americans think companies are doing better consistently, um, which, which is encouraging, I, I think. Um, you know, I worried in the early days of this virus. I, I, I mean, I, I'm sure like many on this call, I went through, I think it was about a week of, are we going to take a huge step backwards? We've made so much progress on purpose. We have the business roundtable statement last August. You had Davos, which is was all this year about stakeholder capitalism to Jeff's point versus the shareholder primacy. Right. And it felt like we were reaching a corporate tipping point around purpose. And I, and I, and I held my breath. I'm like, oh no, oh no, are we going to lose it all? And just to the contrary, I think you saw, as Jeff said, the early actions, it was companies focused on employees first. That was the key stakeholder. Um, how, what am I going to do with my employees? Am I going to retain them? Am I going to continue to pay them? Am I going to maintain health benefits? Am I, then am I going to keep them? And it's just been a rolling wave of now what now you know and and so that while there was an initial triage of liquidity and our own employees i think it's now it's just continued to broaden across other stakeholders uh and i think that will continue for quite some quite some time encouraging and so that's actually a great tie-in one of the the two sort of pieces that i'd love to chat about today are sort of the corporate purpose piece and the corporate vision but also the personal the individuals right because as Jeff said, if, if humans are at the, the, the core of this and, and people are at the part of the core of this, you know, how is that interplay and what does that look like now? Um, and Beth, you know, we were chatting a little bit yesterday, maybe, maybe give some thoughts on that as well, sort of what you're seeing as that sort of, is there a difference in the, those two and how they sort of connect? And then Jeff, let's, let's talk about the same from your perspective. Well, I, I think the personal piece is really interesting. Um, you know, everybody, you know, I, I, I'll speak for myself. You know, you live a life of privilege. So at this moment in time, we're, everybody's working from home. We're, we're blessed probably to have the resources to be able to do that in a, in a very different way than a lot of society is able to do that today. Um, that is out of a job, worrying about where the next meal is coming from and caring for, for family members. So what I'm witnessing and seeing is this, this, comparison of some who feel guilt for the privilege and and a sense of a bit of a loss of a platform to do more, uh, that desire to do more, a guilt that they're not doing enough, in part because they've been disconnected in some sense from, from an ability to do more, mm -hmm. um, contrasted with, you know, the, the people who are um, you know, feeling purpose in a different way of just me not being able perhaps to provide for their families in the way that that is their purpose um, to take care of their families and they're not able to do so. So I, I think the um, experiencing both of those is really important for all of us right now. Um, again, for a company, then if you're going to meet stakeholders where they are, right. those are two sets of stakeholders that are in very different places. And Jeff? Yeah, so um, let's talk about personal purpose first. Uh, humans are innately social animals. That's how we survived 50,000 years ago on the plains, and that's how we always survive as groups, not as individuals. And one of the fundamental aspects of that is built into our DNA is helping others, right? You In a team, high-performing teams are always teams where you ha uh, people help each other out, perhaps put others' success before theirs. That, that, that's what a great leader is. The military always says leaders run into danger before their troops in order to protect those troops first. That's also how you build loyalty and trust. I'll, I'll, I'll trust you if, you if you're there to save my life. And so mm -hmm. This idea of personally feeling purpose, it's your ability, whoever you are, well, whatever color you are, whatever gender you are, whatever age you are, is to give something of yourself to others. And the true measure of that is not in what you say, but what you do, the say-do gap. And um, I think innately, we, when, when we can't close that say-do gap, we feel unfulfilled. 
Um, uh, when you when you can say that you want to do something and do it, and then you personally perceive that you're doing it, you feel fulfilled, and then others see that you're doing it. That's when you're leading as a role model, as a purposeful leader. Mm -hmm. um, and those words matter, uh, and then the actions matter too. And this is this is the difference at the corporate level of an organization. And Todd, you went through this, um, creating and codifying the words of a purpose, the words of a vision, the words of the values and the behaviors related to it. And then actionizing them, operationalizing them throughout the organization, because the words are one thing. The words without the action to back them up are basically then just marketing. I love marketing, but it's not purposeful then, right? Um, I always like to say with regard to what does it mean, how does um, uh, personal purpose and vision uh, connect with uh, organizational purpose and vision, if, if, if a CEO uh, desires or aspires to have a purposeful organization, then it it's required that you have leaders who could role model and cascade that down to the organization. You know, I, I always say, if you want to learn how to ski, would you hire a ski instructor who never skied in their life? The answer is no. If you if, if you wanted someone to do your taxes, um, would you hire a firm who never did the taxes? The answer is no. So if you want to be a purpose-led organization, does it make any sense to hire leaders who don't know their own personal purpose to role model? The answer is no. And I think that, that to your point, that's a, a, a really overlooked part of this whole purpose movement. It's not about just the organization. It's putting the right people in there um, so that they can take care of their people. You know, the old saying, people don't quit an organization, company, they quit a manager is true here. Uh, the words don't matter as much as the actions. I think it's interesting right now. Um, you see a lot of the, the disparity again between what the larger companies can do and the more purpose-driven companies. That it, and if they've been more purpose-driven, if they're um, operating more for the long-term, sustainable, they went into this crisis more resourced and able to, you know, to 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 carry out their purpose a little bit better. What, what I um, feel for is the smaller companies who, who have every sense of the, that commitment toward purpose, but ne didn't necessarily come into this, you know, um, with, with a war chest and able to do a lot of things. They want to help. They want to do things um, in another way, but, but they came into this crisis and, and basically hit a wall and hit it hard um, and are really struggling. And what I find um, rewarding is to see them finding ways to execute on their purpose. They, they are still carrying it out, and but just finding different ways to do it. And I think that translates to your point, Jeff, about a personal level too of it's do what you can to help up, you know, just do what you can. And we, no one should judge the actions of others when they are well motivated toward trying to help others, whether, whether they're huge actions or small actions right now, our responsibility is to do what we can. Yeah, and I, Beth, I think that's an, an amazing point that um, as long as you're doing something within your means, it's no one else's point to judge unless you can look inside and understand what those means are and what, what, what you've given up to make that happen. So every single person and every single organization um, can act, if you will, according to their means. And and no one should feel guilty about if that doesn't measure up to what the bigger corporations are doing or the or, or individuals who um, have more to be able to do. What I find, um, I've witnessed it firsthand. So uh, many of you know, my wife is an entrepreneur, has her own company. Um, and I and so I live it every day of some of the reactions that, that have been taken. And and I will tell you, uh, you know, um, her company um, distributes their product through major retailers. And it, it's been interesting for me to watch as a, a gay female owned business to see how that um, how a, a, com a big company treats that kind of a supplier and how how her company has been treated is has actually been really different by different big companies uh, and and it's consistent sort of with how they behaved over time so it's not like the coronavirus hits and companies suddenly act purposeful they've either either acted purposeful for you know a very long time or they haven't and what i'm seeing is it's fairly consistent um with the way they've been uh which which is which is why 
I think this commitment to ESG, the commitment to purpose is it is important. It has always been important. It is going to emerge from this period of time as more important than it ever has um, because we're, we're seeing it play out live. Uh, and um, some companies are just being exposed for whether it was real or, or perhaps whether it might not have been. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Beth, I wanted to, to, to say one thing there, Todd, if you're, if you're okay with that, which is, you know, many people listening might be wondering what they can do about this. And you, um, uh, you identified something they could do, which is um, um, try and understand coming out of this, the perception of your employees and your customers. It's not what you think as executives as a company, but what they think, how they perceive you to be acting. And take this moment in time coming out of COVID to ask them, did you perceive our deeds and our words um, in, in how we've acted and what we've said, either through um, commercials or marketing or hearing people like us talk, did you perceive them to be aligned with what we've said we stood for? And if the answer is no, this is a great time to try and close that gap. It's a great time to think about the root cause of that and to say, I want to do better next time, right? Um, I want to move ourselves in this other direction. I, I've heard many people comment right now that said, your employees and customers remember how you treated them during this time. And that will be a harbinger for things to come. And Todd, you and I were talking earlier about uh, Maya Angelou uh, and her, her, her famous quote, which I'll misquote a little bit, but it's, you know, people won't remember what you say, people won't remember what you do, but people will always remember how you made them feel. Um, and, and that's true, and we should remember coming out of that. So, Beth, to your point, the smallest little gesture, whatever it might be. I'll tell you one little funny story. I was shopping with my, with my son uh, a week ago in the parking lot up here. We're in farm country in a, uh, a pickup truck. Um, I, we, my son and I walked by, and a, a, a husband and wife were in the back of the pickup truck with masks. I had no idea what they were doing. We started unloading our goods, and the guy, the father, started walking towards me. And I didn't know what was happening. And I thought he said, um, do you have any Purell? I thought I was going to get mugged for, for Purell. Like, what a COVID story. But he actually came up and he said, do you want Purell? And he said, we were just at Walmart. They just got a great big stock in. And if you're looking for your Purell, head down there. And four other people in the parking lot heard it. This guy took a minute out of his time to do something gracious. He knew everyone might have been concerned. And that little thing, I've, I've told the story 10 times of coming up and asking if we want a Purell and telling us where to get it was, Beth, what you're talking about. You take what you have, you care about other people. And in that gracious act, I had a tremendous amount of respect for him, for his family, and really hope for the world. I want to key in on that, that, that hope for the world piece. Because we were chatting about this, I think all three of us separately, about how after 9-11, the world sort of came around New York and gathered around New York and New Yorkers banded together and we, you know, we, we came out of it stronger. And I think there is this opportunity for us to take this moment and come out of it stronger in a better place and more connected to other humans. We've stripped away so much of the varnish. One of the things that I've explored in a couple of these conversations in the past is exactly this, this idea that the varnish or the, the veneer that we have created through social media, through our platforms, through our titles, through our companies, is is stripped away in a lot of ways right now, right? We're at home. We're 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 having fire alarms go off or dogs bark or everything else. We're seeing into people's homes. What mattered six weeks ago doesn't really matter now. And what does matter is how we're making people feel, what we're doing in the world, the impact that we're making. And I think that's, you know, the eternal optimist in me feels like that's going to be a really great thing for us to come out of this time with. Oh, it feels very much like the quote, you know, we're getting to simplicity on the other side of complexity. I don't know how many calls I've been on with um, other executives that have said, you know, in this time, they've had time to you know, clean out their closets, <laughs> clean out the, the, the cabinets. I'm like, well, what am I doing with this stuff? What, why do I need this stuff? You know, and, and it's just, you know, that sense of people, um, the connections, the people, the caring, so much more important than the stuff. But on but on the macro level, you take a take a sector, and I, I think we have some representation from the pharmaceutical sector on the call today. Take the pharmaceutical sector. I mean, look at the challenges that that sector has been through, and the, the, the just you know st stakeholder challenges, and, and and that they've navigated and navigated, and and coming together in this moment of time where 
the competition is not themselves. The competition is the disease. And they're partnering like they've never partnered before, accelerating time frames. ROI is not the, the decision maker. It's can we do it? When can we do it? Um, and 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 many that I've talked to within that that industry you know, are just so proud of what they're doing and yeah. and that and and everybody in the world's cheering for them you know in, in a way that they've never cheered before and that collective that sense that Todd that you're talking about that sense of what we can do together is far more powerful than what we can do individually and you know we, I hope we can carry that so in 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 the um, spirit of this conversation, um, what's happened there is these pharmaceutical companies have come together and found a common cause, a common calling that's higher than their competitiveness. They found a purpose, and what their purpose during this time actually it's a nuance. I would call it a mission um, rather than a purpose because there's a finite period. A purpose is, uh, and I see a question there, a purpose doesn't end. If you find your purpose to be something that's really part of your DNA as either an organization or an individual, and there's a discovery process that you go there. So I do think the purpose should stay the same, um, Jerry, although your vision might change over time. But uh, a mission has a beginning, middle, and an end. The Army sends people on missions. You have your orders, you go and you do it. They found a common cause for a mission, which is the survival of the human race. And it was well above anything else they could have done. And I'll tell you, that's one of the things that bands us all together. When it's up to the humanity, survival of humanity, um, our sectors don't matter. Our competitive doesn't matter. By the way, this is a, a, perhaps a nice segue into DNI or into belonging and inclusiveness. None of that matters. We are all humans at the core. And we should all be treating each other uniquely as humans, no matter what our circumstances are. And if you do that, you're living a purposeful life, um, whether it's on a short-term mission or a longer-term mission. And that's what the pharmaceutical companies are doing. They bonded together because there's a higher calling. And I'm glad you called that out, Beth, because it's really apropos um, to show that when partners have a vision or a calling that can all be connected, you could do things in extraordinary ways. So I want to comment on that and sort of reframe it a little bit for a follow-up. Uh, and one, I'm glad you mentioned Jerry's uh, question on the side here. As we go along, if folks do have questions, please feel free to pop them in and we will integrate them into the conversation. Um, what about, let's, let's think about, because pharmaceuticals are a great example of an industry that can save the world. Um, but equally, there are industries that are decimated right now where people don't have the platform that they did. I mean, I know Beth, for example, well, all three of us, I think, have been on planes. This is the longest I've never been on a plane in my entire professional career, um, which is very short. I'm only in my late 20s at this point. So, um, but, you know, I, I, <laughs> what about, you know, I know Beth is on the, the board of the US Olympic Committee and, you know, my partner, Brian, is an actor and the theater world is completely decimated. And there are those, you know, whether you're an athlete who has been training for the last 17 years and your whole purpose in life has been to get to those Olympics that not only aren't happening, who knows when they will and how they will and will you be old enough and uh, what's too old or out of practice or whatever. And, you know, equally, he was supposed to open in a gentleman's guide to love and murder this weekend for his 40th birthday as the lead. And that's totally gone. And who knows when the next play, you know, when, when is the next time that any group of people will get together in a dark theater? side by side to experience the community that theater brings together. And so how do these leaders in the space that they operate again, understand and think through what is a, is it a redefinition of purpose? Is it a rethinking of purpose temporarily? You know, I, I'm curious how both of you would approach that. Well, how I think about it is I think what you're driven by. Um, if I think about as an athlete, obviously they're, they're, they're driven, you know, if you're an Olympic athlete, y your goal is to win a gold medal. And, you know, we've just gone through a period where, as you rightly point out, Todd, I mean, the games have been postponed for Tokyo 2020, but for some athletes, that means they're canceled. Some athletes won't, won't be able to be there um, right. in the next year. So those dreams are devastated. But when you think about, for instance, Team USA as a whole, and the, the bigger story, you think about the stakeholders, what has been decimated? Our youth sports landscape. Our kids are not out playing sports. Our kids are stuck inside. Um, and, and that, the longer that goes on, that is a tragic 
story in terms of the youth, you know, sports landscape. So, so what are the Team USA athletes doing around that? Well, they're thinking collectively about how they can use this time to inspire the kids, to, ins- to get them doing workouts and things at home. And what, what can they do to try to keep our kids playing? Because we know how important sport success in sport is to success in life. And so, you know, the, the, the Team USA athletes are rising to the occasion. Um, you know, you will yet to see it play out. But, you know, they're, 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 they're rethinking how they apply their purpose. They haven't changed their purpose. Um, they're just trying to see how to manifest it in a different way and how to, how to perform on, on a different level in a different way with the same result. Cause ultimately when they win that gold medal and they stand at the top of the podium, what they know is yes, they've had personal success, but for society, they've inspired generations. And, and that's what most of them are driven by. I like that framing a lot. I think the idea of getting out of, maybe not out of yourself individually. So the, the, the goal of being on the podium as an individual with a gold medal and focusing much more on the team and what the team collectively can do because they're all in the same spot. Um, and paying it forward for the future. I think that's a really important piece of this because we do know that this will end at some point um, and yeah, and sports will return and these young young leaders will get something out of sport. Jeff, your, your thoughts on that? Yeah, if we take that into the corporate world, the, the parallel, and Beth, you mentioned this before, it's, it's long-term thinking and short-term thinking. And the reality is we as individuals and corporations, we require both to survive right? Um, I have a family. I have young kids. I'm thinking about the long term, about um, their education, about um, their inheritance, if we're lucky enough to get them, about my grandchildren. But at the same time, I have to be thinking tactically in the short term to help them get through today. It doesn't mean I've forgotten about the long term, but the way I help them get through today is different than it was six weeks ago, right? Um, Because I have a son who's completely isolated and has COVID in Chicago right now and two others who are fine. My tactics, my short-term tactics have had to change. And that's what Beth was saying too about the athletes. I think their commitment to something that's bigger than themselves, sure, they want to win the medal, but it's also about representing the United States. It's about being on the team. It's about collective um, greatness, right? Well, they've put that long-term aside for the moment and redirected it for short-term. This is always the balance. This is the balance that we all have. We have it at corporations, right? The pharmaceutical companies put their long-term strategic objectives, which is ROI and revenue and shareholder or stakeholder um, uh, capitalism aside and said, it doesn't matter right now. It doesn't mean they've forgotten about it. And so one of the things that we're seeing with leadership, bringing it back to that, is um, one of the great qualities that have been exposed here is being able to adapt right? Mm -hmm. You can't have a fixed playbook. You have to have an adaptive playbook. But as long as you keep the long-term in sight, that vision, the long-term, you can adapt and still do things that are aligned to where you want to go. It's just a slightly different path. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, My son's going to drive from Chicago to New York where we are. And let's just say he's going to take I-95. He knows where he's going. What happens if he comes across, uh, unfortunately, some construction or other thing that causes him to have to detour off of 95? What does he do? Well, he takes an exit. He finds the other way, but he's still headed towards me. He still knows where he's going, right? And this is, I think, the great balance of leaders today, which is when you know what you stand for your purpose and you know where you're going, the way you put those together has an infinite number of possibilities based on the circumstances you have to deal with. And we're all facing that on both an individual level and a corporate level now almost daily. It's it's going to be interesting to see where this goes, though, because when you think about the, I mean, we are, we are seeing um, how companies and, in, and individual leaders play out their purpose, the actions that they take. And, and I, as I said early on, I think we're going to see this in rolling waves as, as you engage each stakeholder where they are that's going to change as we move through this crisis in its various phases of trying to reopen the economy, maybe shutting it back down and how we go through that. I think what, 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 what I, what I project is that companies, every one of us on this call are going to keep peeling that onion layer back a little bit further and a little bit further and human rights um, are going to come 
I think, onto our radar screen in a very different way because we all know what we are going to see very soon is what we all know it, it is there, but we're going to see it so much more clearly as how deeply unequal we are yeah. and, and how our companies um, confront that with our, with our execution around purpose is going to be very interesting and very necessary. And it will be the corporate leaders who, who really lead the way on that. We will, that we will have to. Well, and I think that's exactly what we've seen thus far, right? If you look at the number of African-Americans and Hispanics who have been infected and or died from this disease far outstrips those of the majority population. I think we've also seen administration take the opportunity of distraction as they have for the last three years and anti-LGBT animus continues in lots of places. We've got states that now prohibit gay couples from adopting and today was going to be one of the potential days that the Supreme Court would have announced its decision around the employment on discrimination uh, cases. There are three cases that the Supreme Court has been reviewing. Um, the, the decision isn't today, by the way, and we think it may come out on Monday. But just taking that as an example for those who aren't aware, because of the fact that the Equality Act hasn't passed Congress, in 27 states now, you can still be fired legally for being gay and 34 for trans, or 33 for trans, because Virginia just passed a, an inclusive act, just well, just signed into law in the last 10 days. But because we don't have full equality as a country, that that case is monumental for the uh, for the LGBT plus community, and I'm very interested to sort of see in the age of COVID. Let's say you know there there are multiple ways that it could come down. It could be a split decision. It could be all for us. It could be all against us, and it'll be very important and interesting to see how companies align their purpose to the outcome of that case. Just being very specific, right? So if, for example, it says that we can discriminate against trans people but not gay people. How are companies going to respond, right? If it says that discrimination against all LGBT people is not something that the federal government has any business in, right? We're back to where we started, but potentially much, much worse because we've got this Supreme Court ruling. So, you know, I, I'm curious for, for both of you, and, and you know, I know, you know, you, you mentioned belonging and inclusiveness, obviously, Jeff, and you're steeped in this, and and Beth, and, and your work with without leadership and through EY, you know. It, Give me your thoughts. I mean, how, how do you think companies should be thinking about this and, and aligning this, not just LGBT inclusion, but as you said, you know, inequalities broadly um, to their purpose going forward? Jump Beth, I'll, 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 oh. sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'll let you jump in and then we'll get that. Sure. Um, you know, back to something that uh, Beth said earlier, um, I think there's going to, there's going to be a, um, an accounting, a reckoning, if you will, after COVID, which is that you, you saw many of these same companies you're talking about, Todd, say that they cared about their people. All the CEOs said the right thing at the beginning of this process. They all right. did. Um, they can't take it back. Those words are out there. And when they said them, they were being inclusive of everyone. They didn't say, I only want the safety of trans, or I only want the safety of straight white men in middle age, right? It was of everyone. And so um, I, I think what's going to happen here, I hope what's going to happen here is that society will hold them accountable, meaning it's public what they've said. And if they go back to a different actions, a different deeds that don't match those words, they need to be held accountable. Now, I understand it could be difficult for some because, as you said earlier, many companies are going back to what they used to have. Okay, but that's not, and I hate to use the phrase, but that's not the new normal. That's not the way the majority of the world is going to be looking at things anymore. So I am hopeful um, that this um, belonging and inclusivity where everyone belongs everyone's inclusive and everyone's recognized for uh their unique remarkable whatever it is right um is something that continues on because a hundred percent of the company started it when COVID came and that the world the citizens of the world hold those companies who aren't there accountable to be authentic uh and to be honest and the beauty of the crisis may be that we see unequal in a in a broader way we, we really get deeply into um you know we get beyond i just i'm just going to deal with gender uh, that's you know and then, and then i'll check the box like we're going to start to understand this this yep. is about everybody 
um, right. and and I, that that will be good if it does. Well, and, and so that that keys into a couple things that I've seen in a number of conversations and around empathy, and empathy and leadership, as we know, is is not a new idea, and it's I would argue the, one of the most important traits of good leaders. But if you think to you know one of the conversations that we had earlier is. The idea that in a corporate environment or in a business environment or really almost any environment, you're able to cover and compartmentalize areas of your life. So I was speaking with a leader a couple of weeks ago who has an 82 year old mother who she has to take care of. She has a husband. She has three kids. And all of those things were in different compartments in her life before this crisis. Now they are all together. Her 82 year old mother is living with her and she has to make sure she doesn't get infected and she's still taken care of. Her three kids are home from college and from school and they're now back in the house. She thought she was an empty nester. Her husband is old school and really still thinks that she needs to cook dinner every single night. And so all of those things are no longer compartmentalized. They are front and center for her. And she still has to do her day job as a global executive in an organization. And in the same way, one of the leaders that I spoke with last week, we talked about how the idea of working from home used to be sort of an accommodation, right? We started it 20 years ago to help working moms, right? That was the idea. And the real work couldn't happen at home, but you know, that, that, that we could, you know, allow this accommodation. And now that's gone too. In six weeks, it would be almost impossible for a leader with any credibility to say that it is impossible to work remotely because we have just proven that the entire world is working remotely. And so I think about both of those, sort of the idea of, of combining your life in a public sphere in a, in a way that you were no longer able to create that wall and that veneer and the, and the authenticity that creates, but then the empathy now that leaders are coming back post sort of COVID. Um, and and so I'm curious what you both think about that and the idea of returning to work. And, you know, you said there was a reckoning. I think that's a great way to think about it. But also, you know, what are the learnings and, and how will sort of forward thinking companies sort of tackle this and, and use this to, to come out of it ahead? I mean, I, I think it is very possible that smart, purposeful companies, I'm, I'm counting out leadership in that. I, I'm counting on us coming out of this in a stronger position than we went in. How do you see both of those? And 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 Beth, I'll start with you, and and then Jeff. Well, and I'd I'd love to hear Jeff's view on this. Um, I I think this reopening of the economy is going to be um, really interesting to the points we were just talking about about difference. If if because I do think we're going to start to recognize difference of of all kinds, and for once in our lives, care less about it than we care about the outcome of. What are we accomplishing? I don't care that you have a fireplace behind you. I don't like. I I don't I don't I I'm interested. I, like this this the virtual environment has has like we've embraced our differences. I love it. You know we 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 found that we can do this. So as we reopen, I think what companies are going to struggle with is we look at look at any of the major employees. Look at our grocery. Look at the front line today. You know the the, the Amazons the Walmarts, the grocery stores, you know, they, they are obviously essential businesses trying to keep their employees safe and yet having their employees in harm's way. So every company is going to, that's what every company is going to face sort of as we reopen is, uh, again, the principles around safety above all. How do we keep our employees safe? How do we mm -hmm. stay coordinated across, you know, businesses to the extent we can? Um, and, and how do we prioritize key resources? So for instance, the populations that are perhaps more at risk, um, maybe the LGBT population, people of color, how are we going to reopen in a way that is fair and safe? And I think a lot of this is, I, I don't know yet, but my, my suspicion is a lot of this is gonna have to be voluntary in order to respect people's differences, because only people know their own differences. Do I have an underlying condition that nobody knows about that perhaps makes me more at risk? And I want to personally reopen in a different way, Todd, than you or, or than Jeff. Um, right. You know, you, you already saw companies stepping forward wanting some legal protection um, for it, because you know the lawsuits are coming uh, in this. And so, um, I would think companies are probably going to have to do things on a little bit more of a voluntary basis and embrace that employees are going to control their own destinies to to some extent. Jeff, I don't know how you feel about that. Yeah, I uh, so I agree. I, I want to um, start by answering by talking about the definition of empathy because empathy is one of those things. What's the difference between empathy and sympathy? And there are lots of ways to look at empathy. The one 
uh, I would choose to be most relevant here is the ability to take someone else's perspective. So to your point, right, you don't know um, what's underlying for a reason someone may not want to come into work at ever. It doesn't matter. Um, it's trying to understand and understand that they have a different perspective and trusting that um, they, they have good intention for whatever they're acting. And, and Beth, to your point, and this is what we've done and we do in consulting all the time, um, the best consultants are outcome-based consultants. It's ultimately not necessarily how you got there because sometimes you have to innovate and be agile, et cetera. It's are you getting to that same destination? And so mm -hmm. defining what that destination is, I see Antonio here talked about employees' well-being and mental health. Well, it's a really interesting thing because the CFOs of the world, many of them, look at balance sheets. And there was a report that EY was involved with helping to form over the last couple of years called the uh, EPIC report. It was about long-term value. And there are a number of drivers of EPIC, one of them being the employee driver. Um, they tried to put metrics behind the employee driver. And ultimately, the financial metric is a lower cost of labor. If you get to lower cost of labor, you're going to be able to sustain that over time. Well, there, <clears throat> that doesn't sound very human, does it? But let's back up for a second. How do you get to lower cost of labor? Well, if, if employees are m fulfilled, then they're more engaged. If they're more engaged, they're more productive. If they're more productive, you have a lower cost of labor. So let's back up to the equation. What gets an employee or a customer to be more fulfilled? Well, Antonio, one of the thing is, one thing is they're feeling like you care about their well-being. You're helping their mental health. Um, you're understanding them. You're being empathetic to their personal situation. There are several other things, but if you if you really want to drive business, whether it's on the employee side or the customer side, um, drive loyalty, drive retention, um, drive even people paying higher prices so you get higher mar margins, they need to believe in what you believe in. It comes back to leading with purpose, leading with vision, and taking care of the well-being um, of your employees and your customers. Jeff, a quick sidebar on that. How would Simon Sinek approach, and you probably have spoken with him, like you know, taking the virtuous circles and the believing in the product and the, the pieces that you mentioned or believing the purpose of the company, like what do you think his perspective would be on the current conversation? Uh, I have not spoken with Simon lately, and um, his virtuous circle, he calls it the golden circle as a reminder. Um, oh, I, 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 I think Simon recently published a book about uh, called um, the infinite game of business, um, and he talks, it's game theory, right? How do you how, how do you play for the long term versus the short term? That's really what it is, uh, but he's using words from game theory. And I think that he would say many of the things that we've talked about, that right now companies have to play the short game. How they play the short game, they are going to be remembered for that. It potentially redefines how people perceive what they stand for. And Beth, coming right back to your point, coming out of this, People are not going to forget in times of crisis, in times when it mattered most to care about your customers and employees, how did you treat them, right? So yes, the front line is asking workers to go out and put themselves at risk. Those who aren't comfortable don't. Those who are, hopefully those companies are providing some extra things that we're not seeing to, to, to help those workers feel like, yeah, in addition to just doing good for the other human beings and helping the world to survive, the company has my back in, in some way. And if that's true, they're willing to sacrifice. When you believe that the company has your back, when you believe that your friends have your back, you're willing to go into battle, even to put, put your life at risk. And I think Simon would say that too, because he, he talks a lot about leadership from the, the way the military talks about it. He got a lot of great advice from a, a, a retired three-star general, um, uh, Marine Corps general who led leadership development. Um, and so that's the way I think Simon would answer it. And I think that's the way most of the leaders of the corporations today, the good, the purposeful, the vision-led organizations are trying to treat their people and customers. And then ultimately, this will also be good for the shareholders. Right? Forget about what the stock market looks like. Today. This will ultimately be good for the shareholders as well, right? Right. It all trickles down to all those different pieces. You're exactly right. But starting back with that authenticity and the uh, the driver there. Beth, I, you looked like you were going to, you, would you like to comment on that? No, I was I was just thinking about as Jeff was answering that question. I don't know why I was I was thinking about our political leadership, um, and leadership. And, <laughs> yeah, but but across I, I mean I mean politicians sort of in general of we elect them, we don't select them. We 
select our corporate leaders because we expect them to handle, be able to handle certain things, to, to lead a company with purpose, but also to lead in a crisis. You know, I mean, we, that's that's in the calculus of how you select a corporate leader. And, um, you know, and, and they have tools that they can use and they can control. And I just, I think it's a, an interesting um, reflection of how we choose our political leaders isn't necessarily um, you know, if you think back to the 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 ad in a, a couple elections ago, the three a.m. ad, you know, who would lead? Who who wants yeah. to get the call at three a.m.? Yeah, you know, yeah, that's that isn't necessarily how we select political leaders. So, you know, why do we? Their definition of success is: Do I get reelected? And so they're going to be motivated to make decisions along those lines. So I just find it interesting that um, to to. Uh, so what you saw me probably smiling. I was just thinking, how do we select? and political leaders and so when there comes a time of a pandemic and a crisis it doesn't necessarily mean that the the leaders we have elected um it's you, you sort of either get lucky or unlucky of whether you have um leaders e equipped um you know we're seeing that play out across all the the, the spectrum of politics today but um it, it's just a, an interesting challenge if you think back to F FDR in World War One. Um, you know what did he do? He, he went out and he hired uh, or he, he recruited um, uh, Bill Knudsen, the head of GM at the time, to sort of head the arsenal, the defense arsenal for the United. You know to, to do all the logistics. I mean, you know, I, leaders get things done. They just get things done perhaps in different ways. And it was a tangent that was running through my mind. Up, sorry. Good <laughs> idea. You bring up an. You bring up an interesting point in politics, and, and maybe we could just port it over to business too. Um, first, what is a leader, and what what is the definition of a leader? I, I suspect that many people that we would consider in corporate leadership, and I'm not talking about the CEO level because I do think that CEOs, as you said in part, are selected for a bunch of other criteria, including how you can lead during crisis. Um, but they've been appointed to be an executive in charge. That doesn't make them a leader. The pandemic really will also um, uh, be a reckoning for those people who really are just executives in charge versus those who are true leaders. Uh, and I, I don't think everyone wants to be a leader, nor should they, right? There are some people who are really well suited to be managers or supervisors, right? Um, I work at EY where uh, there's a, there, there's delivery work being at a client site for a year in a row, and there's other more strategic work. If you asked me to do delivery work for a year in a row, um, I wouldn't survive. That's not suited to me, right? right. No, no. It, it's just like, and there's some people. Right. So what what is the definition of a leader um, versus a manager versus executive? And back to your point, um, we elect our officials without necessarily even knowing if they're leaders, although we call them that because they're in a position of authority, which doesn't make them a leader. We all know people who are not elected to positions of authority who are leaders in high schools and elementary schools. And I'm talking about the kids, right? right. Um, and so this might also be another opportunity for us to redefine the, the, the really loose use of the word leader and for us to all to decide what it means to be a true leader uh, and who do we want to follow and maybe for corporations to reevaluate where they put different people in order to get uh, the, optimi the optimized uh, value out of their specific unique skills. It's one of the things I'm seeing in some boards that I'm on is you. one of the first things in the triage, the immediate phase of this virus was triage. How are we gonna treat our employees? You know, what do, you know, those, but it was also from a board perspective of how equipped is our CEO for this period of time? Um, you know, I, do, do we have the right CEO to lead through a pandemic <laughs> and a crisis of this magnitude? And the answer isn't always we have the right one. Um, and you, you've seen some companies having to make some quick, quick change outs or supplement in, in, a, in a way. Well, but I, I, I want to key on, on several things that you said. One, I think that will tie into part of the, the, the reckoning, but also holding accountable, right? Because we are seeing, if, is it an executive in charge or a leader? And I think that'll be really important to remind people of it as we go through this. I'm also very, I, I love that you use the GM example with FDR. 
um, because it's what we're seeing now, right? Businesses are the ones taking, you know, Amazon is the one who's helping save the country, right? Because they're the ones that are still getting things to people, right? And business leaders are the ones as they have done for equality, in my opinion, are the ones that are far out, out maneuvering government to keep the country moving and to keep the world moving. And I, I think that, that, that always, that, that gives me hope. I mean, the, the political dysfunction can be overwhelming at times, but then when you see, you know, companies like, you know, GM, you know, even ahead of an executive order making ventilators, or you see Pfizer and the other, you know, pharmaceutical companies, Mr. Myers, Squid, et cetera, Gilead, you know, the, the, that is how I think we will move forward through this. And that is where we're seeing true leadership in action. There are definitely some political leaders, not obviously from the, the, the White House per se, but I agree with you. There are some great leaders at other levels in government. And I think that that sort of the role of business, I think, continues to be underscored in, in making sure that we're moving forward. Um, which I, is, right. I couldn't <laughs> agree more. And, I, and, you know, and that's what you're all about, taught it out leadership, which is really understanding that the, it, it is that that corp, the corporations right. can change the world. The corporations can save the world. Corporations can mess the world up, too. But, yeah. you know, but but in particular, you're focused on, you know, what the corporate world can do around the LGBT agenda. But in this in this time, I just commend you for, you know, holding conversations that take us all out and zoom out and, um, you know, have a broader discussion about the importance of what companies can do and how important leadership is. So thanks for what you're doing. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. I, I'm reminded by a comment that you've made a couple of times in, in over past years about companies and their opportunity to change the world and that they literally, it's almost like a filter, right? You're bringing people into your company and those four walls all around the world and the values and the purpose and the vision that you live by as a company are instilled in those people, ideally, if you're doing it the right way. And then they go back out into the world and they can actually change the world in that way. And I think that's such a, a beautiful metaphor that, that you've used. And I, I, I think it's a great way to, to help us sort of wrap up. I, I'd love for both of you just to give us a you know, a closing thought, um, and then I'll just give a, a couple closing comments. But, um, you know, I would just, you know, for everyone on this phone, just think about what you can do because it's what we do when nobody's looking that matters. I had, uh, you know, it's a situ, I'll go back to EY since that's my roots, Jeff's on. And, you know, um, but I had a situation early on in this, in this crisis. I, I said, my wife's an entrepreneur, has her own company, and um, EY's had this program called Entrepreneurial Winning Women, where they, you know, have supported women entrepreneurs for about a decade. And early on in the crisis, um, a woman, Lisa Schiffman, who runs that program for EY, convened a couple of calls, brought, bringing together EY experts to help these women founders, these women entrepreneurs, around what should we do, around liquidity, around restructuring, around employees, around the SBA loans, around the government stimulus. And, and I don't know if Lisa Schiffman understands how valuable what she did was to those women entrepreneurs. And, and that's what happens when you have a great purpose, a great culture. It's what your employees do when nobody's looking that matters. And that's when you sort of know you're getting it right. And everybody on this call has that ability um, and a platform to do do what you can because it really matters. The resources and the power that you have, don't underestimate how helpful it is to those who don't have it. Thank you, Beth. Jeff? Yeah, I'm glad you told that story about Lisa. I love Lisa and, and great to see that she's continuing to live into her personal purpose within, nested within EY and um, that was a terrific, um, way to do something that she could to help a lot of people. Yeah. I mean, I, I want to show that one of my leadership tricks is to teach, I mean, is to treat um, the people in, in my care, like my family. And uh, I think if you layer that up and the company treats all of its employees like their families and um, what, what happens to your mindset? I mean, then you could say, how would you want your grandchildren to remember you? And with that as a filter, you begin to make the right decisions uh, because no matter who you are, no matter where you are, if you have children and you have a family um, and you say, what world do I want to live to my grandchildren, it will help you make the right decisions. It will start focusing you on putting humans, i.e. your family at the center. And as you see by what the pharmaceutical companies have done, when it comes when the rubber meets the road, we are one big human family. 
uh, we just are. Uh, business and money and politics get the way get in the way of us remembering that. You know, fifty thousand years ago, tribes, the businesses back then, there was only one purpose. It was survival. This COVID thing has sort of flashed us back and reminded us of that. Um, I'm worried how soon we'll forget that. But if we don't, and if you as a leader or a CEO or whoever you are in your corporation treat the people on your teams, the people on your care, in your care, the communities that you, that you touch, your shareholders, your customers, as family, as best you can, I think we can all become great leaders. I love that. I think those are both perfect ways for us to wrap up. Um, Jeff, Beth, thank you so much for your work, for your, your living purpose, um, and, and for your support of our leadership and everyone here. Uh, before we close, I want to just do two things. I want to make sure everyone is aware of our upcoming podcasts. Um, next week, we'll be having our Out Women Gathering with Sharon Lewis from Hogan Lovells and Linnea Urban, uh, who is now the head of the Center for Talent Innovation. You may have seen her as an Out Nexter, um, and now she's all, all, uh, all grown up in the leadership role and now running a major organization. So, so they'll be leading an Out Women conversation next Tuesday at 10 a.m., Next Tuesday at noon, we'll be having a quorum conversation, which is our LGBT board leadership organization within Out Leadership. Um, the leaders at KPMG, who are the sponsor of that organization, will be having a conversation with Matt Fust around board leadership and board transition in this current time and how you can still manage a career from a board perspective. Uh, and then we'll be having two other conversations next week. Chris Frederick, who leads global events for Out Leadership, will be having a conversation around pride. As you may know, he led New York City Pride and World Pride. And so he's going to be convening a conversation to discuss what our leadership will be doing virtually throughout the entire month of Pride and having a couple of the leaders from the organizations around Pride, the director of New York City Nightlife, the head of LA Pride uh, in that conversation. And then my next leadership lounge next week will be with Peter Grauer, the chairman of Bloomberg, um, who has served on our leadership's board with Beth, uh, as well as Rich Jenrette from EY is on the board. But the conversation next week will just be Peter Grauer and myself in conversation. Uh, the final thing I'd love to ask is that we're instituting a poll. So we'll end the podcast from a video perspective, but if those of you who are still on can still stay for 30 seconds, you've got five questions that we'd really appreciate your input on. So I want to end where we started and thank you all for joining us. I want to thank Jeff and Beth. I want to thank EY for all of their support. Uh, and I want to thank you for joining us. And I hope this has been useful. I know I learn from these leaders all the time and it's amazing. And I'm honored to get to share their learnings with us. It definitely gives me a, a shot in the arm every time I hear from them, and I know that I've got a few additional quivers um, and additional areas in my quiver going forward into the next week. So thanks so much. Have a great end of the week. Thank you. Bye.